Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's TIU International Affairs Seminar. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Scott Brown, who is a lecturer of politics and international relations at the University of Dundee in Scotland, who I also know from back in my PhD days as a fellow PhD student at the University of Glasgow, also in Scotland. And Dr. Brown is the author of Power, Perception, and Foreign Policymaking, the US and EU Responses to the Rise of China, which is published by Rutledge in 2017, and is here to talk to us today about UK-China relations in his talk, From Golden Era to Seriously Poisoned, Exploring Shifts in the UK-China Relationship. So Scott, without kind of further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to you. Please begin. Thanks very much, Chris, and thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm really pleased uh, to be here to talk to you about um, a subject that I'm working on uh, in terms of my current research, and I think, hopefully, uh, you'll find fairly interesting. So uh, I'll get to the explanation of the title uh, in a second, but um, yeah, here's a QR code, hopefully you can see my screen at the moment. Um, if you haven't already, please follow this uh, to complete a very short kind of couple of questions just about your opinion. Um, and we'll come back to that at the end and maybe kick off some discussion um, around there. And at the end of this, you can enter questions um, uh, uh, to submit to me as well, and I'll look through those. But if you've got questions as we go along, pop them in the chat. Um, I might not respond to them like kind of organically as we go, I might leave them to them, but we'll see how things are doing and we'll see how we're doing for time. Um, I'm one of these people that tends to ramble on quite a lot. So if I'm, uh, Chris, if I'm running over time, just please shout or uh, force me, force me to stop. Sure, of course. Um, so the, the UK-China relationship has gone from one that was described just, you know, as, as recently as a couple of years ago as a golden era. Uh, but then in 2020, the Chinese ambassador to the UK described the relationship as seriously poisoned. Um, and what's kind of interesting is that despite the kind of linearity of China's rise insofar as it's becoming more economically, politically, and military powerful, what we've seen is that the UK's policy approach to China has oscillated between extreme forms of pro-Chinese engagement uh, to quite sort of serious concern and open discussion of China um, as a threat. And this hasn't, this hasn't been a linear development either um, over time. So the golden era first emerged as sort of a rhetorical device um, when Chancellor, then Chancellor uh, George Osborne traveled to China and described a golden decade of bilateral relations coming. And this soon emerged um, as a golden era more broadly and it was reciprocated by the Chinese state. Uh, and in October 2015, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, President Xi visited um, the UK and he praises the UK's strategic and visionary choice of the Cameron government to strengthen ties. And this was a point in time when the US-China relationship um, under President Obama was starting to deteriorate. So it was useful for China to be able to point to US allies that were concentrating on the positives of China's choice. So this, this idea of a golden era became sort of lodged within foreign policy discourse on both sides of the UK um, and China. And despite the kind of changes in policy shifts that we saw after 2016, it was still part of the rhetoric in mid 2019 um, as well. And then within a year, you have this sudden shift to the seriously poison. And the reason that this came about was because the UK government under the new Prime Minister Boris Johnson started to take a series of policy steps that even just a few years ago would have been unthinkable for the UK to do, particularly in isolation from its European allies uh, in terms of stepping out and taking actions against China based on its domestic policies and human rights related to Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Um, and in July 2020, uh, the Chinese ambassador Liu um, described the relationship at a historical critical juncture between you know, continuing on positive path and essentially, you know, going opposite direction and breaking down. 
Um, and this followed extensive criticism and policy changes by the UK government. Uh, for instance, uh, the UK government became very open about what it perceived as the national security threat posed by the involvement of Huawei uh, within its 5G critical uh, 5G network. Uh, the national security law that became, came into force in Hong Kong that year and the revelations of the human rights uh, situation in Xinjiang with relationship to the, the Uyghur uh, group. Um, so the UK became increasingly direct about the challenges and threats posed by uh, the PRC. The PRC retaliated as well with imposing a number of sanctions on individual MPs and academics who were critical of its human rights record. Um, so this was a relatively quick turnaround for the relationship, um, I think. And what I'll try to do today is to unpack this a bit by looking at politics over the past um, 10 years and trying to put it into context as I go. That'll probably take the bulk of my discussion. And then I want to situate this in relationship to the eu china relationship, which the UK was an important actor in actually shaping the, the EU's overall uh, policy towards China. Uh, and then the, the idea of Brexit was to give the UK greater independence in foreign policy, where it didn't need to be concerned about you know, what other uh, 27 member states were up to. Um, and uh, I'll, try, I'll try to place that in a bit of context and look at what's been happening. And I think it's also important, I'll touch on this quite quickly at the end, um, trying to think about how the UK relationship plays out in the shadow of US-China rivalry, because it's not the kind of conventional wisdom that the UK's foreign policy just follows the US direction. Um, and we've actually seen the UK being willing to take a divergent approach to the US uh, at a number of important points over the past decade. And the, the kind of way that that influences the transatlantic relationship um, as well. So just to kind of sketch out why we should, why should we care about the UK's perspective, you know, and I think for someone living in the UK, this is an obvious sort of like answer. But I guess as most of you are probably not UK citizens and you're based probably Christmas Town, and mostly you're in, uh, from Southeast Asia, but a few Scandinavians, right, Chris, um, some others. So the UK does continue to matter, um, not as much as our government probably thinks we matter, but it does matter to both the US and China. Um, it's obviously a key partner for the US across a number of key policy domains, security, trade, and global governance. And it, what we know is that although the US has the capacity to go alone a lot of the time with policy, it does like it when its allies follow its lead. And it sees genuine value in being able to point to countries like the UK supporting its position. So the issue here is not just that it's UK-China relations and US-China relations, but actually the dynamics of US-UK relations at any given time matter as well in terms of how much influence the US has over the UK's position. Um, and that, that has changed as well in the post-Brexit situation because the US used to see the UK as a conduit for greater influence within the EU, that has now gone, and therefore the UK's importance has been slightly downgraded for the US. Um, from the Chinese perspective, the UK is important because it's a UN Security Council member, it's a nuclear power, and although it's not the great power it once was, perhaps a middle power, it still does have considerable power projection capabilities and is increasingly seeing its role, um, sorry, in the future as being in East Asia as well. So China kind of has to pay attention to the UK from that perspective, but they also have a very positive economic relationship. Um, the UK is a massive destination for uh, Chinese investment. The UK is increasingly investing in China as well. Uh, a significant number of UK companies in the past decade have been uh, either outright bought or heavily invested in uh, by Chinese firms, including state-owned or state-affiliated um, firms. And the UK, of course, like many European countries, imports a lot of consumer goods. Increasingly, the UK's services industries, particularly its financial service industries, see China as an important uh, future market for themselves. So I hate to do, well, I don't really hate to do a bit of self-promotion because I wouldn't have done it. Um, Chris has mentioned that before, right? But this is a continuation of my research themes, right? And so uh, I'm here to talk to you about my research. Um, when I did this work, although I was looking at US and EU um, level policies, 
I did also look at individual member states um, as case studies and, and try to understand how the major players influence the shape of the EU's policy. And the UK was one of my case studies. So although I kind of like talk about the UK-China relationship after Brexit as sort of my new research domain that I'm trying to enter. I've actually been doing this for you know, a significant number of years now. And for the most part, the UK's China policy, because it was able to influence the EU level, didn't really have that distinctive a foreign policy from what we could describe as the overall EU policy, at least up until you know, the 2010s. Um, but definitely up until 2016, there was a lot of congruence between what was happening in UK foreign policy discourse and actions uh, as what's happening in the EU. But what I kind of tried to argue um, in my previous research was that when you look at European foreign policy discourse and the, the factors that influence decision makers, you know, um, choices around how to approach China, was the, the opportunity threat binary wasn't really applicable and there was much more nuanced understanding of how China's rise was playing out and particularly thinking about China as an economic opportunity and a political opportunity the EU and the UK saw as possible to socialize China into the international arena to merge as a responsible great power. Now Perceptions of China as an economic threat um, did exist, but were not particularly dominant, and particularly compared to the US, where there has been much more significant concern about the economic threat of China's rise, purchase of debt, um, shift of manufacturing bases uh, overseas, and so on. Um, this, this hasn't been a significant part of the EU's foreign policy discourse from you know, the, the late 80s through until uh, about 2016. That was the cutoff point for original research. And when the US has been concerned with the military security threat of China, perceptions and discussions of this were virtually non-existent. And this wasn't just an, like sort of accidental when I interviewed officials about this. They were quite clear they, they genuinely didn't consider China as posing much of a military security threat to EU countries. Um, and that to the extent that there were any concerns, it was for the Americans to deal with. My office light just switched off. I keep forgetting what happens. But since 2016, what we've seen is a notable shift in discourse both in the EU and the UK. But the UK is different because it's been more willing and able to act in terms of implementing policy changes. So we see a genuine post Brexit divergence between what the UK and the EU are doing uh, with respect to China. And what, what I personally find really interesting is that given this long period of unwillingness of politicians to talk about China, even as a challenge in the UK and the EU. Now in the UK, what we have is constant references, not only to China challenges, but perceived and actual economic and security threats. And uh, I'm just more generally uh, willing to discuss this. Also what we've seen is that China is a much bigger news story in the UK and European media than it was, um, you know, People, when I started my research as a PhD student, a lot of people asked me, like, why do you care about European China relations or UK China relations? It's not really a big issue for us. It's something for Americans to look at. Um, and now, you know, there isn't a day when China doesn't feature in our mainstream um, news in some respect. So I feel kind of vindicated in that sense. Um, but it also means there's a lot more to keep on top of. So I'll spend some time kind of trying to do an overview of what's happened over the last decade. And I know chronological presentations aren't always the most exciting and so on, but I think this one does have to, to understand where we are just now, you really do have to, you know, do a sort of process tracing and understand the changes in policy over time. So last decade plus one. So in 2010, the UK um, produced a hung parliament in its election and from that emerged the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition. Now initially the government relatively didn't change Chinese foreign policy, uh, sorry, foreign policy towards China, I should say. The focus was on continued financial uh, economic recovery after the crisis of 2008. So the, the China policy continued to be about engagement but there was a certain degree of willingness to challenge China on certain issues, which had been a feature of the UK's policy over a number of years. And for instance, in 
Um, 2010, the UK government uh, pushed back against China's request to lift the European Union arms embargo. And in fact, this government actually uh, further legally enhanced its arms embargo against China. But in 2012, the Prime Minister David Cameron meets the Dalai Lama. Uh, and this is again something that foreign, uh, foreign ministers and prime ministers of the UK government have done over a number of years. Uh, and it was anticipated that, of course, there would be the usual reaction from the Chinese government about this. This wasn't like a state visit. It wasn't supposed to be a political visit. They met at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. So this was really about, you know, a religious leader meeting uh, leaders of the, the English church and so on. And David Cameron happened to be there as a state representative. But apparently what went wrong here was that David Cameron didn't anticipate the level of response from China and was actually very surprised at the uh, ramifications diplomatically. He was basically frozen out meetings with China, wasn't given the opportunity to travel to China, and major US, uh, UK businesses started to complain about the lack of investment opportunities and wanted the government um, to do something. So in 2012, the UK government had an internal cabinet debate play out um, over the direction of China policy. Now, Cameron was apparently open to listening to the arguments from the two major camps. On one side was Chancellor George Osborne, who said essentially, uh, and he later said this in public, that the economic relationship with China should come before everything else. Human right concerns, sure, but realistically, the UK can't really change the China's policy. Therefore, you know, just forget it and we'll concentrate on economic priorities. Whereas the Foreign Minister, William Hague, uh, who's on the, the right hand side of Cameron in this picture, um, argued that the UK needed to maintain a values based foreign policy and it would be a dereliction of the UK's sort of uh, its own identity, its values in the place in the world if they did not pay attention to what was happening uh, in, in China at that time. In the internal debate, Osborne won out. Um, he and Cameron endorsed his policy. And effectively, from this point onwards, the UK's foreign policy towards China was an economic policy. And Osborne became uh, the principal player within the UK government. So the kind of the shift, the shift, the sudden rapid shift in the UK policy was not driven really by external cha change of situation. China had been fairly clear in advance of the potential ramifications of a meeting with the Dalai Lama. The Foreign Office had experience of dealing with this with previous prime ministers who had all met the Dalai Lama as well. So it was the domestic politics and particularly the relationship between the principal actors within the cabinet that led to this shift. And we saw an immediate and rapid reorientation of the UK's policy with the idea of getting top policymakers back to China and uh, opening up trade and investment opportunities. And eventually, because of essentially um, this diplomatic reorientation and uh, Cameron saying that he'd turned the page and would never meet the Dalai Lama again, um, he was then allowed to, to essentially, or he was offered the chance to travel to China in uh, late 2013 with a large um, trade and business delegation to sign specific deals uh, with, with Chinese uh, companies and investment, uh, investment groups there. Um, and he, he was quite clear in an, uh, an op-ed piece that was published uh, in the UK's Guardian newspaper at the time. He, he was talking ahead of traveling to China saying, I come with a clear ambition to build a lasting friendship that we can come a blueprint for future cooperation between our countries. So here, whereas the government had been at least willing to signal displeasure uh, with certain aspects of China's domestic and uh, foreign policies, uh, it was now clear that the UK wasn't going to uh, raise these anymore and would prioritize the idea of friendship uh, between the two countries. So this kind of continued 2013, 2014, we had a lot of high level exchanges statements where the UK basically praised China's economic development. There were a lot of delegations from the parliament, particularly the all-party China group, which is a cross-party uh, selection of MPs who are generally pro-China, particularly from an economic perspective, 
um, and they just kind of keep quiet about the you know the other stuff like human rights abuses um, and so on. So in 2015, this is really the peak of the diplomatic effort on the UK's part. The UK signs up to the um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that China's just launching. It's, I think Chancellor Osborne makes a big deal of the UK being the first Western country to sign up to this. And it was unusual because it caused the US administration under Obama to directly criticize the UK's China policy uh, and other Europeans such as Germany who signed up as well. But the UK made a big deal of this uh, as the AIIB and the UK's involvement. While the US was trying to persuade its allies, including like the UK, Germany, Japan, etc., not to touch the AIIB. So this is the point at which the terms in the second half of the year start to emerge and pervade bilateral discourse, as already mentioned. Uh, and uh, Osborne talked about, let's stick together to make Britain China's best partner um, in the West. And like Osborne was given interviews to prominent uh, media outlets like The Economist, openly saying that he was convinced that the US had its approach to China completely wrong and that we should think of China's rise as an economic opportunity, and that was all. Uh, and that was obviously the kind of language and rhetoric that upset the United States, who saw very real concerns and reasons to be concerned. There was a number of European countries as well, uh, the, one, the, the smaller uh, the Scandinavian countries, who tend to have more of an emphasis on values in their foreign policy orientation. And um, this was obviously pre-Brexit, and they were very concerned about the rhetoric um, that the UK government had now switched to and were concerned about how that might try, how they might try and use the EU as a vehicle uh, for that orientation as well. And uh, in late 2015, uh, President Xi had the state visit to the UK, the red carpet was rolled out, he met royalty, etc., and so on. And he praises the partnership policy um, of the UK. And this is against the backdrop of, again, like, you know, in the lead up to these state visits and so on, you had in the background significant pressure from the US not to take this kind of approach. Um, but Cameron was actually subjected to a lot of domestic criticism for his foreign policy towards China. And he was accused in the media of kowtowing to Beijing. And um, I was kind of hesitant because of the kind of stereotype displayed in this image, but the fact that this image appeared in an article in one of the UK's major sort of current affairs magazines, The Spectator, to kind of illustrate how it was perceived. Uh, and The Spectator is a magazine that leans to the sort of right of the political spectrum and is generally quite supportive of the Conservative Party in general and had been supportive of the UK's uh, under Cameron's uh, domestic economic policy, now become a vocal critic of his policy. And uh, the Dalai Lama was actually interviewed by a journalist around this time and asked about his thoughts of like, you know, the shift from when he last met Cameron to, to now. And apparently he just answered and said, money, money, money. That's what this is about. Where's morality? And the fact that you had the Dalai Lama, who's very respected in the UK, um, uh, has very positive public perception, openly criticizing the UK government's approach, got a lot of media attention in the UK. And this was at a time when China wasn't really that big a deal in terms of media coverage in the UK, but this was kind of like the first time that like open criticism of the UK's China policy kind of really ramped up um, in this time. So there's a perceived abandonment of human rights issues in particular. The Hong Kong protest, which kicked off in 2014, had seemingly been ignored by the government and even the Conservative government's backbench MPs in Parliament uh, were very critical and they were the ones that were trying to push for a policy change and, you know, clear statements against what was happening. But the best they could get was, you know, the government saying we're keeping an eye on the situation and uh, monitoring. So then in 2016, of course, we had the Brexit referendum and this occupies a lot of uh, the government's attention. David Cameron resigns after he loses the referendum and Theresa May replaces him as Prime Minister. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the UK's political system, but our Prime Ministers are appointed uh, if they can command uh, a majority in Parliament, so you don't need a new election to have a new Prime Minister. And there was a fairly immediate cooling down 
of the UK's approach to China uh, and backing off in the discourse. Part of this was, again, because China was less of a priority. The real issue was the relationship with the European Union at this point. But we did see the first kind of more open discussion of the potential security challenges posed by China's involvement in uh, the UK's economy. Now, uh, in the period when Chancellor, uh, sorry, when Osborne was Chancellor, um, one of the, the sort of great coups for Chinese investment was that um, China, one of China's major nuclear um, companies, CGM, were granted uh, the ability to invest in a nuclear power plant that would be built by France's EDF. And this was like the first time, because China wasn't really you know, known for being at the sort of top end of the game in terms of civilian nuclear energy development, it was a win for China because then it could then say to other potential uh, you know, clients around the world, look, we're, we are invested in the UK, therefore, you know, we are, this is important. But there was a review of China's investment uh, within a month of Theresa May becoming Prime Minister. Um, but, and it was explicit that this was because of potential security concerns. And they wanted to check that China's involvement would not extend to involvement in uh, the actual development of the, the network the infrastructure. Uh, that would be needed um, for the nuclear and they, they were concerned about China having access to um, or potential control in some way over the power plant. It was eventually approved, um, but the fact that it was this review was a sign of changing uh, policies within the UK. So in 2017 onwards, you can see that actually China as a priority for the UK was downgraded, partly because of Brexit, but also because the sort of enthusiasm for China that was, you know, um, personified by Osborne himself, there was nobody in the cabinet that had that level of enthusiasm for uh, China at that point. Now, the government does retain the golden era rhetoric, partly because there was initially hopes that China would be one of the first countries to offer the UK an independent trade deal. Um, but it was kind of clear that the new government was not as committed to the concept um, of a golden era. But it was also politically hard for them to drop. They couldn't just suddenly stop calling uh, a golden era or China as an important partner um, of the UK because that would have immediate economic and political ramifications. Um, but a significant, a significant downturn in relations came in 2018 because the UK, again, the Belt and Road Initiative, which I haven't really covered and I kind of skipped over in the Cameron period, but that was something that was obviously connected to the AIIB, uh, and the Cameron government was quite positive about this. In 2018, uh, China has this large forum for world leaders based on the Belt and Road Initiative, and then goes around trying to get them to sign up on to a memorandum of understanding. And the Chinese government had been trying to push um, the UK government for a number of months before the summit to sign up to this memorandum of understanding. And the UK refused, and Theresa May was quite clear that although she saw potential benefits of the Belt Road Initiative, the UK was not going to sign this memorandum of understanding. She said this explicitly openly uh, you know, to the media that she wouldn't be signing the memorandum of understanding. And this was seen as you know, a repudiation of China uh, and something, not, not outright humiliation, but it was not a good look for China to be refused by um, the UK at this point. And China was kind of surprised because they assumed that the UK was weakened by Brexit and therefore would have to sign up to this memorandum of understanding. So this is kind of the first real cooling off um, relationship. Fast forward to late uh, to mid-2019, May resigns because she can't get a Brexit deal concluded. Boris Johnson, uh, who you may be familiar with, is appointed in July and then eventually holds an election in December 2019. So his main focus is also the Brexit deal with the EU, which he eventually gets in uh, early 2020. Um, Johnson is initially quite enthusiastic about the China relationship when he comes to office. Um, he, when he's appointed and he's asked about China, he talks a lot of the Belt and Road Initiative um, in terms of economic opportunities and doesn't really have too much to say on the human rights front or anything else about like the rise of China more generally and the challenges that it poses in East Asia uh, and globally as well. But it was kind of clear that Boris Johnson was also very keen 
to improve the UK's relationship with the US and to try and get the US as one of the first countries to offer the UK a post-Brexit trade deal. So he was trying to play a balancing act between two economically important countries that he wanted trade deals from. But this became quite difficult, especially as the Trump administration became even more critical through uh, 2020 with the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. The UK government is hesitant to blame China um, and avoids the US's rhetorical style that Trump um, adopts. And it, the UK is actually criticized by the US for this at this point as well. Uh, later in 2020, we see a number of policy sh shifts that are building up to this seriously poisoned um, point uh, within the relationship. Um, so the Huawei decision first, the, UK, the government decides that the UK's uh, telecoms networks are to remove Huawei technology from its infrastructure by, I think, 2030 um, because of potential, you know, uh, espionage, hacking and, you know, subversive control. Um, of networks and deciding this is a security position. And the UK government, in explaining its decision, directly cites the US government's concerns and um, requests for other countries to do this as part of the reason for why uh, did it. And this was kind of like, you know, partly to try and, you know, signal to China and say, look, we're getting a lot of pressure here from the US. It's not like we just decided this on our own. But also partly to sort of like say to the Trump administration, we're on your side when it comes to China, even if we're not saying the exact same things that you are. The UK government itself and uh, politicians in Parliament really ramp up their criticisms of China on key issues, um, particularly uh, with the Hong Kong situation uh, because of the UK's historical ties there, um, but also increased revelations about the, the the human rights situation in Xinjiang, and there's a lot more open criticism than the UK would previously uh, have uh, involved. And in 2020, um, the UK government took a sort of unusual step of having its arms embargo policy, which had existed against China since uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre of 1989, extend it to the Hong Kong government so that they're not exporting any um, materials to Hong Kong. Uh, that could be used in the suppression of what was seen uh, for, uh, sorry, the suppression of legitimate democratic uh, protest by Hong Kong citizens. Um, so the, this this resulted in this point of the Chinese officials calling the relationship seriously poisoned. Um, and like what, what, what I hope to maybe communicate here is that um, I, I I, I think these rhetorical flourishes of golden era and seriously poisoned are both exaggerations. Um, there was never really a genuine a golden era um, of UK China relations. It was more of an aspiration. And I don't think that even in 2020, with these policy shifts and then the imposition of sanctions on both sides, I don't think the relationship was seriously poisoned. You know, you never we've never had diplomatic relations severed, we've never had any sort of um, large scale economic sanctions imposed, trade has continued. Um, so I, I think these rhetorical flourishes are designed to send signals. I don't think it's an accurate representation, but nevertheless, the shift in discourse is important. The way that diplomats and leaders talk, I think, is very important. So, I mean, the UK was becoming aware that the chances of a post Brexit trade deal with China were relatively slim. So there wasn't really too much to lose economically here. Um, in this. So the, one, one of the other key things happened in the UK in, um, through 2019 and 2020 was the emergence of the influential China Research Group in Parliament, which has tried to bring, and it's, it's not like, you know, outright opposition to China, but there is an attempt to scrutinise China's domestic and foreign policy behaviours, and also to hold a mirror up to the UK's policies, um, particularly after it left the, the European Union. And this key constituency of politicians have been able to shape and reshape the political debate on China and China policy in the UK. Um, and so this has been something that the government's had to pay attention to a lot more, whereas, in, you know, un unless it's around big issues like Tiananmen Square, Hong Kong retrocession, um, and so on, a lot of the time, UK Parliament tends to leave these sort of controversial policy 
uh, positions on China to the government, the increasingly Parliament is trying to influence what the government executive is doing with respect to UK's um, policy. Uh, the 2021 Integrated Review, this new strategy paper, which was supposed to reorient uh, the UK's foreign policy and defence policies uh, after Brexit, was really interesting because it does openly talk about uh, potential threats of China, uh, and it talks about China's increasing international assertiveness, and talks about the systemic challenge posed um, to, to the UK. And this is the first kind of um, security and defence document of the UK that has been as explicit um, about China in this. By the same time, although like there's a lot of media attention on this, it's important to note that there is also the thread of continuity on the need for a positive trade investment relationship and for cooperation on transnational challenges like climate change. So what I get when I'm looking across the last decade is that there's no simple linear path of UK-China relations you know, this isn't just, these policy changes aren't just because China's becoming more economically and politically powerful. Um, those things have been, you know, constantly in the background, but the UK has continued to uh, shift around there. And then you have this interplay um, of relations. I'm out of time, Chris. Okay. Um, okay, so... I think, I mean, this is a statement that's now almost 60 years old, right? The US's then Secretary of State, Dean Anderson, talked about Britain losing an empire and not yet finding a role. I think that still is entirely applicable today. And I think that if we look at the decision to leave the uh, European Union and the challenges that the UK has in balancing its relationship with the US and China, reflects the fact that the UK still doesn't really know its position in the world. And while it was in the EU, it was able to influence the EU's foreign policy. And I'll just kind of skim through some of it, we'll come back to um, later on. But the UK was, with France and Germany, a key actor in the EU's foreign policy. And Brexit does represent a loss of influence with respect to China for the UK. There's no getting around that, despite what politicians may say. But it is also a loss for the EU as well. The EU relied quite heavily on Chinese expertise, uh, uh, sorry, of UK expertise of China. It delegated sort of policies on Hong Kong to the UK almost entirely. Uh, and the fact that it has lost a valuable uh, resource of hard and soft power. So I talked earlier about the shift in European perceptions um, of of China as well at the same time. So they are, they are also shifting for their own reasons. Some member states are not, some smaller member states, particularly you know, the likes of Hungary are very pro-China and haven't shifted in their position. But I think the EU finds it much more difficult because it's still trying to, it still has this aspiration of a common EU foreign policy, is that the discourse can shift, but the policy can't. And I think Hong Kong policy is a really good example of that. Well, the UK was like, you know, extending its arms embargo and imposing sanctions uh, on, you know, individuals who were responsible for introducing national security law. The EU expresses, expresses grave concerns, but takes minimal action in response to this. Um, so, yeah, I think that the UK's post-Brexit shifts are about the UK having different interests, but also because the UK has this idea of becoming global Britain that it wants to have a global role and it wants to have more influence in areas like East Asia, where although it has economic interests, it doesn't have a defined presence and hasn't had for some time um, at this point. So it, it's kind of the UK's position here has been that, you know, is is managed to you know, stake out a different position, but it's also avoided some of the negative connotations of recent developments in EU-China uh, relations, such as the EU trying to drive through the Comprehensive Agreement Investment in late 2020 at the behest of the Chinese government. The UK was initially, when it was in the EU, one of the massive supporters of a new EU-wide investment agreement with China and was an architect of what this, the initial shape um, of the negotiations for what was then the partnership and cooperation agreement. But then by being outside, when it sort of came to this sort of crunch um, time when the EU was really pushing for this, the UK avoided the sort of like criticisms there. And if we look at what the EU is now trying to say, it launched its own Indo-Pacific strategy paper 
uh, just last month. But for many people who look at EU foreign policy itself, it's actually quite disappointing because of how thin it was. It doesn't really say anything new at all and just continues the same themes with respect to um, China policy as well. So I will, in my last couple of minutes, try to contextualize this. I've talked about the US um, along the way. Um, Chris Patton was the UK's last governor of Hong Kong. And in his book that he wrote, his reflections on this relationship, year after leaving Hong Kong, he wrote that Washington will only have spasmodic support from European countries whose pretensions to a common and honorable global policy are, alas, regularly turned inside out by Chinese facility playing off uninformed greed of one against the unprincipled adverse of another. I don't think there's a better summation of how the EU-China relationship has played out and the US-EU-China triangle has played out. I don't see anything that has changed fundamentally in the 23 years that, since this was published. So I always think of that quote and think about how important it is. But what does that mean in context of the UK now being outside the EU? Well, the UK considers itself to have this special relationship with the US, um, but the positioning isn't as straightforward as it would sometimes, you know, conventional wisdom would lead us to think, right? Um, the economic importance, the desire to have an independent role, to have some kind of distinctive identity, and historically, because the UK had been conditioned, has conditioned itself to try and shape European approaches um, to, to China, the UK has found itself trying to play a balancing act between the U US and China. And it hasn't clearly chosen a single side. And even with the AUKUS deal, um, which you're perhaps familiar with, um, China wasn't mentioned explicitly, but the intention was unclear. And the defense ministers and interviews afterwards made clear that it was about China. Um, within this. The UK kind of, this was kind of talked about initially, it's like, okay, the UK is really choosing to side here. But not really, because just a couple of days ago, Boris Johnson was talking about China and talked about what a great country it is and saying the UK will not pitchfork away investment from China and it will continue to be a gigantic part of the UK's economy. So, you know, people that over the past couple of years talked about, you know, the potential for decoupling from uh, China by the West will be disappointed uh, or surprised by these kind of um, things. Um, <clears throat> I think, so Boris Johnson has said like, you know, there are still sort of values here, but you know, the, the legacy of Osborne's old school chums, uh, sorry, of Boris Johnson's old school chums, Osborne and Cameron, that legacy is still there and the economics is very important for the UK and it's a material reality that's very difficult to escape from. So I don't think it's fair to say that the UK's China policy is driven by the US. And I'll just conclude very quickly on China's perspective, because I'm, I'm not really a scholar of China's foreign policy per se. I'm a more Western uh, foreign policy analyst who looks at kind of these, uh, China as a subject. So the UK is nowhere near as important as the US and the EU, but it does still matter. China's reactions have been relatively predictable, but it often seems to create a conundrum for British politicians as to what to do. Um, and China continues to criticize anything that considers or can shoehorn in uh, a, a claim that is interference with its domestic affairs. Um, but there's not, been, there's not really been any sizable changes in China's policy towards the UK. What we have seen is an increase in the use of wolf warrior diplomacy uh, in terms of criticizing the UK's government positions. But ultimately, the UK has very little leverage to actively hurt China. Mostly for China, it's about reputation and image control. So the kind of key takeaways, hopefully I'll leave you with, uh, and then we can get to the discussion, is that the UK's perceptions of and rhetoric of China have hardened in recent years. This ha we do have a shift in policy although perhaps not as far as you might expect, given some of the things that have been said and put in policy documents within that. Um, so the UK still finds its position is not a binary between opportunity and threat. China poses both for the UK. Um, and some people have criticized this as like, you know, the cakeism of Boris Johnson wanting to leave Brexit and saying we want our cake, we want to have our cake and eat it too. And perhaps that applies to the orientation towards China at the moment as well. But I think an important part of this is about how the UK perceives itself as well and what kind of role it wants to have. 
you know, fundamentally, the UK could choose just to leave security in East Asia up to the United States and, you know, sort of free ride on that basis and concentrate on, uh, you know, European security with respect to Russia. But for, whatever, for various reasons, they want to have this kind of influence elsewhere. So thank you very much. Sorry for me talking uh, too long. I'll be happy to take your questions in the chat. I'm just going to switch my screens here because I want to see uh, if we have any responses to my um, questions here. So let me see. Um, so, okay, resume share. Okay, so first I asked, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so first I asked, is Japan, for Japan, is the UK an enemy or a friend? We've got 19 responses, so thank you very much. Let's have a look at the results there. Okay, so we've got a more or less dominance of friend, couple, looks like maybe one or two, and uh, lower in the scale as well. So interesting, okay. Now, this is a question where I was really interested in local students based in Tokyo thought at the moment. Is China an enemy or a friend? Let's have a look at the results here. Okay, so shifts down here. Perhaps not as low as I thought, but okay, leaning towards enemy or that interesting. Okay, on a scale of one to 10, how important is the UK for Japan? Okay, yeah, okay, more important than I. I thought perhaps would be. And following on from that question, oh, let me tell if I did that. Should Japan, where's the results? Okay, should Japan and the UK cooperate more on security matters? It seems to be a slight leaning towards yes, um, but some hesitancy. Really if there are any questions here. Okay. Like, like, respond to these ones and then the ones in the chat from... Yeah, sure. So let's... Well, for, first, I want to thank you for a, a really fascinating presentation and giving us so much to, to think about and to discuss here in our, our discussions. But I think um, there are questions. Can, there's one in the Q&A box already, and I see that there's some questions that are there. So I'll let you go ahead and take care of the, the questions that have already been posed. But thank you again. Sure. No, thanks. Thanks. Um, Hopefully, hopefully people uh, took it away. Hopefully, hopefully my accent wasn't too thick. Sometimes I, I get that issue, and um, so I hope you could also. It's good practice it. for for our students, some of whom <laughs> might be going grad school at some point in in Scot in Scotland um, or the UK or elsewhere in, yeah. in the world. Yeah. My accent, my accent's pretty mild compared to a lot. So uh, yeah, this is, this is so true. is conflict <laughs> eminent between China and Japan? If so, how eminent? Uh, well, China-Japan relations are not my uh, forte. I tend to think that I don't think conflict is imminent between China and Japan or the US or any other country in terms of intentionality, right? I don't think anybody's sitting going, let's have a war. Where I see the issues coming is the conflict. We might, we might mistakenly blunder into conflict, right? It could be in the East China Sea, over the disputed territories, the South China Sea, passage uh, through the Taiwan Strait as well, in particular in these freedom of navigation operations. What I'm concerned about is that, you know, by nature, China's Navy shadows any sort of like um, naval operations through, through these zones. Um, you, you may end up in a situation where that results in conflict through, you know, somebody bumping up against each other, uh, somebody uh, misinterpreting the intentions of the other side and preemptively attacking, and that escalates into conflict. Uh, I think things like, you know, in 2001, there was the uh, Chinese fighter jet that collided with the US spy plane. The, the Chinese fighter pilot was killed. The, U, the US spy plane was f forced to land on Hainan Island, um, and the, the crew were held hostage for 11 days. These kind of things are, are where I'm worried. And of course, with the East China Sea and China's establishment of the ADIZ, the air identification zone, and you know the, the potential threats to shoot down you know, fighters uh, over what would be considered an international airspace, these kind of things are what I'm worried about. Uh, 
So I, I don't, I, it, it could be through an accident. I don't think either side are planning to fight a war. They, they obviously plan for conflict, uh, sort of like from worst case scenario perspective. I don't think it's any intentional policy at the moment. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, hopefully. Um, will the Commonwealth support the UK in any of the actions against China? Uh, I mean, the Commonwealth is quite large with distinct interests. A number of Commonwealth countries, uh, particularly African ones, have very extensive economic relationships with China and probably don't want to jeopardize that. And I know uh, maybe this question is coming from the fact that UK politicians have talked about reinvigorating the Commonwealth post Brexit and like the UK playing the leadership role in foreign policy. I think you'd be hard pressed to really get that. Um, uh, other members, like, you know, um, might be interested in aligning with the UK, but really, there's more costs and there are benefits for a lot of the Commonwealth countries um, in that respect. Uh, what element would you think the UK used to bring about uh, distinctive foreign policy now the UK is separated from the EU? Um, well, I think the one where it can make a distinctive policy really is by being clear about its values uh, and its, its desire to protect um, democracy. In Hong Kong, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pessimist when I look at Hong Kong now. Like, I think Hong Kong as a democracy is gone. I don't think it's coming back until we see, you know, the collapse of the CCP um, at some point. Um, but I think, like, you know, the UK's ability to extend visa offers to um, Hong Kong nationals under the Vienna uh, thing was a, a good distinctive policy. Um, it may not materially affect that many people in terms of who can actually move here. But I think the symbolic value of saying to the PRC, we're going to allow people to leave because of your domestic policies is positive. Um, there's been a lot of talk now in the EU more recently over Taiwan. Taiwan has become like a bit more of a live issue, whereas previously, like your European countries would not touch Taiwan with like a 10 foot large pole. But now we see a shift in that. I've actually got an article coming out next year. Um, on, on the EU-Taiwan shifts, I've looked a little bit at the UK. And I think that that's an area that, you know, there's getting more discussion in the UK is that, you know, what can the UK do more to support Taiwan so that it doesn't end up being, you know, uh, essentially col like colonized or retaken by the PRC, uh, which has, like, you know, a set deadline for uh, reunification. So thanks, so those are a good bunch of questions. Uh, I'll just switch over to... Scott, I was going to say, we, we have one question from um, Professor Akitoshi Miyashita, who is Dean of International Relations here at oh. International University. So let me, he has his hand raised, so I will let him sure. share his, his question. Okay, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you, Professor Brown, for your presentation today. Um, I really appreciate your time and uh, I learned a lot about uh, UK-China relations. You know, UK and Japan are in a similar position having a strong influence from the US as an ally uh, but trying to seek for some kind of an independent foreign policy. Um, you mentioned about uh, AUKUS, uh, the Aust Australia UK uh, US uh, uh, alliance. I you wonder what's the rationale behind the UK to join this, um, um, you know, alignment? Uh, because, um, you know, if uh, I understand that uh, maybe UK would like to increase a presence in the Indo-Pacific region, the military presence may be very, very important. Um, but at the same time, uh, you run the risk of being dragged into a conflict, regional conflict, that the United uh, Kingdom may not want to be involved. Like if there's a, you know, conflict over Taiwan or South China Sea or the, you know, Senkaku Dao Yutai Island. Um, if not a military, direct military confrontation, what if China start doing some kind of a blockade, uh, quarantine? Um, do you think that the UK would be um, obliged to do something based on this, uh, you know, AUKUS uh, agreement? 
um, what do you think is the, the, the real rationale behind this uh, security arrangement? Yeah, great question. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, tuning into the presentation as well. Um, well, I think I think there's kind of like multiple reasons that the UK probably wanted to have its involvement in this arrangement. Uh, one is signaling to the US its support for the US's um, sort of pushback against China's asset or perceived growing assertiveness um, around the world. And the UK still wants a trade deal with the United States, even though the Biden administration made sure um, that that's not going to be a priority anytime soon. I think the UK wants to send positive signals in that respect. Um, it's also important for the UK's defense industry because although um, a lot of the technology initially will be coming from the United States, the UK obviously does have uh, a number of the US-based companies or cooperation between UK and US defense industries. Um, and I think, you know, potentially using this, not just the, the specific um, nuclear powered subs, but also just opening up more opportunities for uh, defense related trade with Australia is a good thing um, for, or perceived to be a good thing for the UK's defense industry, which has had a number of challenges in recent years and so on, right, it's looking for new markets. Um, obviously, the big spenders um, in terms of global well, military just now, China, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, can't, can't export to China. It has extensive uh, defense relations with Saudi Arabia already, but that's becoming you know, increasingly concerning for the public. Australia is not going to have that same sort of reaction. So there's kind of like an easy win for the UK um, in that respect. As for actually in increasing its involvement in, uh, you know, the, the region more widely, you know, trying to develop this presence, I think that's part of the, the sort of global Britain rationale and trying to be a bit more distinctive because the rest of the European Union is kind of hesitant to do that. France has ambitions, um, but others like Germany are also far more hesitant to project European power that far out. So it gives the UK a chance to say, that it's still got an important global role. Um, so this is about selling it to the, the UK public and also to uh, allies um, around the world and trying to build up credibility for this idea of the UK as global Britain. Um, but yeah, it does run the risk of potentially being dragged into um, a conflict that, you know, is not directly uh, at the moment a, a, a threat to UK security. And by, by participating in freedom of navigation operations, that risk is certainly there. Um, and whether it's actually actively been thought out is open to question because there are sort of like, you know, people like um, Professor Patrick Porter, who's sort of a UK based and very realist, emphasizes that the UK's priorities really should be defense expanding and basing its capabilities in and around Europe to shore up against Russia. And they think that this is essentially uh, an unwise ambition and putting capabilities that the UK can't afford to have far away from the UK uh, and doesn't really serve its national interests. So I think I think these motivations are kind of mixed for the UK. Um, but it'll be interesting to see because it's it's fine just now for the UK to do this when there's no real costs per se. But what happens when the costs manifest? I think that's an interesting question to see how that's going to play out if, if we do get to that stage. But th thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Scott. I see there's an, an, another question that is posed here in the in the chat. I think you got the, the first couple of them already, but kind of like what are the lessons that can be learned from the UK's experience of first outreach to China? And then kind of conversely, the Kind of falling apart of of that relationship. Sorry, I can hear. There's oh, sorry, yeah, there's there, there's there's a, a bell ringing. I'm um, here. Um, so so kind of the lessons learned um, from the UK's outreach experience, which appeared to be largely kind of mercantilist driven at the outset, and 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 that falling apart. But then you kind of ended on another question that I kind of had in my mind as to kind of 
although you're 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 arguing very much that that this isn't kind of a case of kind of UK kind of bandwagging with the US and we shouldn't necessarily look to the US to to understand what UK policy will be towards China as the UK is pursuing its own continues to pursue right even today in 2021 despite AUKUS its own economic interests kind of what what are the what are the kind of the the takeaways um from this right this kind of experience of Kind of golden era too seriously poisoned as you you frame this talk. Yeah, well, I think I, I think that the the UK and other countries need to be very cautious about adopting particular you know phrases in their foreign policy that are convenient at a particular point in time because it creates a set of expectations on China's part as to how they're then going to behave. Um, I remember, like you know, one observation by another scholar back when the EU forged its strategic partnership with China, this there was a formal declaration in 2003, and somebody pointed out that, you know, um, what China means by strategic partnership is different from what the European countries mean by strategic partnership. Europeans think that strategic partnership means you can talk more about sensitive issues. China thinks that strategic partnership means you don't talk about these issues because you're partners, right? You don't ask difficult questions of your friends. Um, so I, I think this is kind of problematic and you, you can get yourself into traps. Like, you know, the UK government started to adopt kind of like the rhetoric of, you know, uh, cooperation for mutual benefit and win-win cooperation and some of these kind of favored phrases. Um, and I think that sends a signal to China about, you know, we're going to cooperate in this domain, but that also means we're not going to criticize you in other domains. Um, and and that, that continues to be a problem. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's going to, like, you can't just say that we're going to decouple from China, right? This, it's it's material, materially exceptionally difficult, and I, I don't think there'll be much real appetite for that. So, but I think when talking about how we're engaging with China, we need to be a bit clearer and use our own terminology and not just adopt what, you know, the PRC want to um, in that respect. But I think also, like, I, I, I deliberately left aside sort of IR theory perspectives in this discussion, which I, I do often use, I use in my research a lot more. But I think because, like, increasingly, like, you know, these structural level explanations, which are becoming popular again around China, like power transition theory, um, for instance, is, is now uh, coming back into vogue. Um, a lot more. I don't think they do a good job of explaining what's happening because the UK is not just reacting to what China is doing or its levels of power. It's responding a lot more to internal political demands and in, uh, domestic economic considerations as well. Because ultimately, the Conservative government um, part of its reputation rests on economic management domestically. And it's very difficult to turn around to major sections of the UK economy and say, you can't deal with China more, or we want you to deal with China less. It's going to be exceptionally difficult. Then there's like sort of the support um, from Chinese business, uh, sorry, from UK businesses who want to be more involved in the Chinese market dries up domestically. So there's there's these considerations as well. Just trying to look at it the level of state-to-state -state interactions isn't going to get us very far. And I don't think the UK is certainly not unique in that sense, but I think what's unique in the UK is the extent of oscillation um, in recent years. Thank you, thank you. And I, I guess just kind of one, is there, I think that we've covered the, the questions that were posed. Um, one additional question, I guess, Scott, it's something that you had mentioned in your presentation about EU or in external policy towards this part of the world. And you mentioned that with regards to China, we're going to probably we can we can see a change of discourse, but not a change of policy. Is is that also the case for because you hinted that with Taiwan that there is a substantive shift in in policy? Is that does that hold true for Taiwan as well? I think it'll be harder to get a, a, a proper revision of the, the EU's level on Taiwan. We're seeing certain member states start to shift a little bit. Like Lithuania has been really interesting, I think. For such a small member state, the, the sort of supposition in here is that smaller member states in the EU either don't have a China policy, they just kind of like say, sure, you guys work out and we'll follow along, or that they're so afraid of the you know retaliation of China 
that they'll just kind of like, you know, try and hide from the question altogether. But Lithuania has really stuck its neck out here and said, no, we're going to have more of a relationship with Taiwan. We're not changing diplomatic recognition, but it's perfectly legitimate for us to have this kind of level of relationship. And then um, the paper that I wrote on the EU-Taiwan relations was part of a special issue that's coming out in China quarterly. Um, and I called the article fraying at the edges because I think that's where we're starting to see is that the EU had a very cohesive position on Taiwan was that we're not going to talk about Taiwan because it would upset our relationship with China and having a common policy on the PRC is difficult enough without thinking about Taiwan. But I think over the last few years, we've started to see member states, not just Lithuania, but others, and particularly domestic constituencies within member states dissatisfied with the way that Taiwan is being treated and not discussed by the EU. And I think, I think my own view is that Hong Kong, what's happened the past couple of years has been a bit of a wake up call for people who kind of thought that maybe things would play out all right with Taiwan. I think people are starting to realize that that's not, that can't be taken for granted and that perhaps um, the EU needs to rethink it. I don't see a large scale shift in the EU's policy in Taiwan anytime soon. I think we'll see, you know, incremental things where like, you know, the EU comes out in support of member states having more extensive relationship with Taiwan, but it's ultimately up to them. There'll certainly be no shift in the EU's one China policy or anything um, as substantive as that. What might happen if China does push harder on Taiwan or actually starts, you know, in worst case scenario, does launch some kind of intervention against Taiwan, what the EU does then will be a very big moment for the EU's foreign policy, I think. But I wouldn't like to call it at the moment. Well, fascinating. A, a lot to a lot to consider. Well, with that, I think I would like to thank our speaker, um, Dr. Brown from the University of Dundee for joining us today. It was a real enlightening presentation and we definitely learned a lot. So thank you, Scott, for taking your time out of your, your morning. I know I got you to, to the office very early um, before your building opens up to, to talk to our students. And um, like to, on behalf of all of our students and, and faculty here at Tokyo International University, thank you so much for, thank you very much for, for doing this for us. And I hope to see you again soon, um, not just virtually, as as the situation permits so thank you so much yeah that'd be really good no thank thank you so much for having me it's been uh, i really enjoyed putting it together and uh, being able to talk so yeah and please if your students have more questions then you can just email me i'm happy to answer by email as well um so yeah thanks thanks for this opportunity great definitely so you can you can find um dr brown as he shared at the very beginning of the presentation kind of via email and also I believe on, on Twitter you're um, you're quite active so they can they can students can find you there as as well. So um, thank you so much and I guess with that I will end today's webinar. So thank you. Thank you so much. Great.